you very much indeed Anne. I'm absolutely delighted to join all of you at Future Human and I'm going to talk to you about a long view of agriculture and domesticated species going right back to the very origins of that idea in the Neolithic. So I wrote about domestication of 10 species in my book, 10 species that changed our world, but this afternoon I'm just going to talk to you about two in particular and then maybe just touch on a third and a fourth. So for thousands um, of years, for hundreds of thousands of years, in fact, our ancestors existed in a world where they depended on wild plants and animals. They were hunter-gatherers, they were consummate survival experts, but they took the world as they found it. Then the Neolithic revolution happened at, at different times and in different ways across, across the globe those hunter-gatherers were changing how they interacted with other species in a crucial fashion. They tamed those wild species and those ancient humans became herders and farmers. The domestication of plants and animals would pave the way from the modern world in many ways. It allowed the human population to boom and civilizations to grow up. Now, going back to the very first glimmers of domestication, the histories of these familiar species then became inextricably intertwined with our own and each one of them has played a part then in the survival and success of our own species. When Darwin wrote on the origin of species he opened his book by writing about examples of species evolving under the influence of humans through the mechanism of what he calls artificial selection and when I look at my own copy of the origin of species that's 27 pages at the beginning of the book focusing on animal domestication. He knew that his readers would understand and would be familiar with how farmers could improve crops and livestock through selective breeding. And then once he'd explored that familiar idea with his readers, he could move on to drop his bombshell that species could be created naturally without human intervention, simply by the environment doing the selection by what he called natural selection. So he used artificial selection as the way to open up people's minds to the idea of natural selection. And he, he discusses selective breeding, artificial selection. And I think that we still use the term artificial selection today, though probably uh, we should just use um, human mediated natural selection. It is the same process. It just happens to be humans that are the key part of the environment that is helping to shape and mold those animals and plants, transforming wild species into all the domesticated species that humans would end up growing and tending. If we look for evidence of very early farming communities, the, the earliest evidence that we can find um, goes back in, uh, in the Middle East, in Turkey, in northern Syria, to around 11,000 years ago. And then the idea, together with the domesticated species like wheat and barley, sheep and cattle, begins spreading. It spreads westwards to Cyprus, around the Mediterranean coasts, and eventually, uh, about 6,000 years ago, it reaches Britain and Ireland. So it takes 5,000 years from its inception in the Middle East to reach the far northwest of Europe. But going back to the origin, it doesn't come out of nowhere, unsurprisingly. We can see changes in society, and we can see changes in what people were doing and what they were eating and how they were subsisting, that go back before the Neolithic itself. So these mysterious stones from the Natufian culture in the Southern Levant have puzzled archeologists for decades. They date to around 12,500 years ago. So that's a good thousand years before the advent of farming in the area. Some have suggested that they come from ancient masonry competitions or even that they symbolize female genitalia so I think the, uh, either the ancient Natufians or the archaeologists coming up with that theory had never seen female genitalia. But a more prosaic explanation, and this is the, the kind I tend to favour, is supported by experimental archaeology. It seems most likely, in fact, that these hollow stones are mortars, that they are designed for grinding cereal grains, probably barley, into fine flour. Now, why do you need to grind cereal into flour? You're making bread. So we know then that these 
pre-farmers were already eating things which uh, would become their staple diet once we had farming coming along. And we know actually that people were already focusing more on gathering wild cereals and processing them than they had been previously. Perhaps they were making bread as well. It makes the Neolithic revolution much easier to understand, I think, because it, it doesn't come out of nowhere all of a sudden. By the time that people were doing this kind of thing and that they were exploiting those wild cereals, um, it's almost inevitable that we end up with the domestication of these grass species, because of course that's what cereals are, they are grasses, not only barley, uh, but wheat and other cereals as well. And I also think that the origins of cultivation might have been much less intentional than perhaps we, we might imagine. Rather than somebody suddenly waking up one morning and having the bright idea to do this, you can imagine it happening almost by mistake. So you can imagine hunter-gatherers going out to gather these cereals, bringing armfuls of wild barley home to thresh off the grains before grinding them up to make bread or perhaps even beer. And some of those seeds, as they're threshing, are inevitably going to escape. And then perhaps you've just got a situation where somebody's looking around the edges of the threshing floor and they notice the little seedlings starting to grow up around that floor. Between 11,000 and 9,000 years ago, we see some changes in the cereals themselves. So we know that people are using these cereals in a more intensified way, that they're beginning to actually farm them, to grow them in fields, to grow them as crops. And the species will change under domestication. The grains get bigger and they also stay firmly attached to the backbone or rachis of the ear. And again, this is not necessarily something that the early farmers are seeking out. It's just that when you, when you are um, bringing in the, that barley or that wheat or whatever it is, um, if you've got ears that stay together, um, then you've, you've, you've got those grains. If they drop off in the fields, then you're not collecting those grains. So you can also see how actually some of those changes that happen with domestication may have come about incidentally at first. And then I'm sure farmers noticed that the grains were getting bigger and that was useful. We can also pick up on these changes, interestingly, not just by looking at grains and by looking at charred ancient grains, where we can look at the morphology, look at the shape of them, but we can also use ancient DNA to track those changes as well, because we know the genetic changes that underpin things like the tough rachis, the backbone of the wheat that stops the grains falling off it. So we can use that to see how domestication spreads through these species. Wheat was just one of the domesticated species that emerged from the Fertile Crescent, which was a really important centre for the earliest domestication. And alongside wheat, the early farmers of the Fertile Crescent were growing barley, as I've already mentioned, um, but also legumes, things like peas and lentils, uh, chickpeas and flax as well. And they had livestock. So very, very quickly, there wasn't much gap in time between starting to tend crops and to herd livestock. They have pigs, sheep, goats, and cattle. Now, the earliest evidence of cattle comes from bones from a pre-pottery Neolithic site. So normally the Neolithic involves pottery, but this is a pre-pottery site called Jada Mulgara, and that's right on the banks of the Euphrates River. And it dates to about 10 and a half thousand years ago. So around the same time as we've got absolutely definite firm evidence of cereal domestication and, and growing. Now, domesticating wheat is one thing. I think domesticating aurochs and ancient wild cattle is quite another. These beasts were absolutely huge, bigger than our modern bulls, and they had magnificent horns. And we have these wonderful cave paintings that our ancestors painted, so they, they knew these animals intimately. Um, and as you can see there, you wouldn't really want to walk up to that and try and domesticate it. I imagine they started with calves. And yet, you know, they, they were caught and domesticated, and it now looks as though this was done for both meat and milk right from the start. We used to think that milk came along a little bit later, that dairying came along a little bit later. But archaeology is now pushing evidence of that back. The evidence that we've got is extraordinary because you think, well, you know, how have you got evidence of milk, of people eating milk? Well, it comes from the inside of pieces of pottery and the very earliest sherds of pottery dating to around 8000 years ago from Near Eastern sites bear faint traces of milk fats. So chemists can actually detect those traces, they can do residue analysis, 
and they can pick up traces of those milk fats. And chemists have found similar traces of milk fats on fragments of later perforated pots, uh, like these ones from Neolithic sites in Poland, where you think, why on earth is somebody trying to keep milk in a pot with holes in? Now, what we think this is, is a vessel for separating, lumps for separating curds um, from the liquid part of milk um, as it is being processed, so from the whey. So what we believe this is, is the earliest evidence of cheese making, which would have been quite crucial for a reason I'll come on to explain in a minute. Cattle and dairy farming spread um, along with growing wheat and those other crops. And once again, genetics has revealed that there is plenty of interbreeding with wild relatives along the way. We see that with the plants and we see it with the animals too. So where the animals are in close contact with um, close relatives who are still wild, there will be interbreeding happening. And in fact, that interbreeding continues on all the way through to the present day. Genetics also shows um, how cattle have changed us. So this is a fascinating story. When our ancestors started drinking milk, or at least um, eating, eating and drinking dairy products, um, drinking fresh, fresh milk could have made them very uncomfortable and likely did make them very uncomfortable, could have even given them diarrhea. Because most mammals do not keep using or keep making the enzyme that digests lactose into adulthood. Now, lactose is the sugar in milk. And when you're a child, when you're an infant, you make lactase enzyme, which breaks down the lactose. But in most mammals, that gets switched off after infanthood for obvious reasons. Milk is a, is a food for, for infant mammals. And as you grow older, you, you switch off an enzyme that you're not using anymore. But um, farming communities were continuing to drink milk or at least to, to eat dairy products. And so what we find happening is um, eventually there's a change and there's a, there's a mutation um, that probably already existed in just a few lucky people who could actually drink milk throughout their lives where their lactase gene remains switched on. And we call this lactase persistence um, and the trait is LP. And what we see really clearly, if we look at uh, changes in, in human populations through time, is that um, eventually in Europe, what you have is a spread of, uh, of this LP gene, this LP genetic variant, um, and a spread of lactase persistence. So in other words, people would have been able to drink milk well into adulthood. And it may be that actually something which is, uh, which is encouraging the spread of that genetic variant, it, it might be famines when people have eaten all of the, the milk products. So if you're making cheese, you are transforming a lot of the lactose. So, so making cheese would have been a way for those early cattle farmers to actually eat dairy products without suffering from the, the ill effects of um, not having lactase. Later on, as, uh, as lactase persistence spreads, if, for instance, you have a famine where you've, you've drunk all the fresh milk, um, sorry, you've, you've eaten all the um, processed uh, foods and all you've got left is fresh milk, people who could digest fresh milk without having diarrhea would have been at an advantage. And we now find that the vast majority of people um, in Western Europe, for instance, have LP, which is very, very different from our ancestors, the, the earliest farmers in the, in the Middle East. So it's interesting, I think, because we are certainly changing those other species as we interact with them, but they are changing us as well in a fundamental way. And this is an example of recent evolution in humans. Now, as well as meat and milk, of course, cattle are useful for pulling things for you know they, they can be used as beasts of burden too and beasts of traction and I visited China some while ago to make a series about very ancient human migrations and when I was there I was lucky enough to visit the Longsheng mountains where there are these amazing rice terraces and actually the the rice terraces are so narrow that they're still plowed um, with oxen and we can see that ox there pulling um, a plow on the range this landscape is amazing. So this is an, obviously an agricultural landscape um, that's been used for thousands of years um, and is very beautiful. We see all these terraces there. Um, Longsheng means dragon's back, actually. And I think when you look at this range, it's, it's practically writhing um, with all the terraces like scales on the dragon's back. So when I visited Longsheng, I 
I was making um, Incredible Human Journey for BBC Two, which was my first big landmark series where we trace these ancient migrations of humans going back tens of thousands of years into the past. But we ended up looking at the Neolithic Revolution right at the end of the series. And I do remember being quite amazed at, at, at these, these rice plantations, these rice terraces, um, and wondering why anyone would invest in growing such what looks like an unpromising plant. I mean, it is, it is just a grass. And I suppose it's the same with all cereals. And especially if we look at the wild predecessors of, of our main food cereals, um, they have, you know, they have even smaller grains. They just don't look like something that you would you would bother to spend much time on. They're not that attractive as a food source, not some, not like nuts or, or fruit, um, which seem to be a much more readily available, easily, um, more, more easy to digest, more easy to process source of energy. So rice domestication starts um, actually a very long time ago as well. It starts the earliest evidence we have is around 10,000 years ago. So it's around the same time um, as, as wheat domestication. And it's in the Yangtze River Valley. So we start to see husks of domesticated rice grains, which are, which are identifiable as domesticated rice, starting to appear in the pottery to temper it. Um, so, so presumably people are eating the rice, but they're also making good use of the husks as well. So the timing is fascinating because we've got this um, beginning of domestication of, uh, of rice where at the same time, at the other end of Asia, people were starting to cultivate the, cere the cereals that grew there, so the, the rye, barley, oats, and wheat. And it was between 11,000 and 8,000 years ago that farming was really becoming established in the Fertile Crescent, that those foods were becoming staples and the wild grasses were transformed into domesticates. And then exactly the same thing is happening, not just with rice, but also with millet in the Far East. Now, I think this seems like far too much of a coincidence. You've got two groups of hunter-gatherers at opposite ends of Asia, more than 4,000 miles apart. There's no communication between them, but we've got these two centers of domestication where people are starting to depend more and more on wild grasses and eventually cultivating them. There must be something linking them. And I believe there is. It's most likely climate change. So, we, we know that there are um, changes, um, profound changes in the climate that precede the Neolithic. Um, the peak of the last ice age was 20,000 years ago, and then the ice starts to recede and the world warms up and those northern ice sheets that would have covered much, much of Europe um, begin, to, begin to recede. And when that happens, when the world warms up, the carbon dioxide levels um, in the atmosphere are also increasing, and that's a very good thing for plants. We would have seen um, increased um, stands of wild grasses that would have been um, you know, really rich pickings for, for hunter-gatherers. And um, then we get the Neolithic and the human population, um, or even before the Neolithic, actually, the, the human population is booming. So we've already seen a, an increase in that human population. Then there's a hiccup, um, and the hiccup is a, is a pretty large one. It is um, a thousand years of winter. It's a really dramatic climatic downturn known as the Younger Dryas. It's called the Younger Dryas after these beautiful flowers, which are mountain avens. Um, they are eight-petaled mountain aven avens or Dryas octopetala. And if you find the leaves of these preserved in an ancient lake sediment, um, you know that you're looking at a very cold environment. They either grow up, up mountains or they grow in lowlands if you're in a very, very cold tundra-like environment. So we can see that in, um, in Central Europe and, and Northern Europe, um, this is what the environment would have been like. It would have been like tundra. It wouldn't have been tundra in the Middle East at this time, but there would have been a drought and frosts in the winter. So it was a really severe climatic downturn. Food resources would have been hard hit, and it may have been this downturn in climate which then pushed people to control their food supply. They're already, we know, using wild cereals more. Perhaps this is the point at which they start to really depend on what had previously been fallback foods, foods they would use in adversity, in extremis, um, but now these, these tend to be um, the staple um, in, this, in this millennium uh, uh, of cold, dry weather. And then eventually, um, even as, as people emerge out of that, um, that drought and that, that cold period, they are used to using wild cereals. 
the wild cereals will, um, like any other plant, will, will start to proliferate after that dry period as well. And humans are kind of locked into that relationship with grasses. So I think this is a very different story than we've been used to. We're not talking about this deep human history as a series of triumphant advances driven by sheer ingenuity and inventiveness, but instead a, a story of challenges, um, very often challenges which are climatic challenges and accidents as well, involving a lot of contingency and also serendipity. So people came to depend more and more on these fallback foods um, during hard times and noticed the cereals growing up around their threshing floors, perhaps not quite the heroic story of the beginnings of farming that we've heard before. Now, it seems possible, and I think even likely, that the same fluctuations in climate were leading to a similar outcome in the Americas. Over in South America, we now have extremely early dates for domestication of another grass, another cereal, maize, which of course now is a massively important staple worldwide. Um, and the domestication of maize now goes back almost as early as rice and wheat. So I think what we've got there is uh, people in these very different places, you know, completely separated from each other, um, but being driven by climatic factors to find a solution. And the solution that they're hitting on um, is to depend on these fallback foods, um, these cereals. Now, tracking the story of the Neolithic and understanding how species have changed as they were domesticated, how, how humans have domesticated ecosystems and how agriculture and livestock transformed human society is itself being transformed by new discoveries in archaeology and uh, the fantastic dating techniques that we've had available since the 1960s. So in the 1960s, we saw a bit of a revolution in archaeology when suddenly it became possible to pin absolute dates on, um, on artifacts, on, on layers of archaeology. Whereas before, archaeologists would have depended on uh, dating sites and dating objects by, uh, by analogy, by comparing them with what was found at other sites, and by looking at where in the sequence um, those objects lay. Um, with absolute dating, we can actually look at um, we can look at much more precise dates, and we can use radiocarbon dating. Um, there are other radiometric forms of dating, um, and also, of course, tree ring dating. Dendrochronology gives us really firm dates as well. The lovely thing about having lots of different types of dating is it means that um, we can cross reference between them and use them to check each other. So we can be really, really sure now about the dates that we're getting. Um, on, on our archaeological discoveries. The new revolution, which, which I think is happening right now, is driven by this, uh, this completely separate, to begin with, branch of science, which has come together with archaeology. And this branch of science is genetics, and genetics is now um, shedding light on um, the deep past like never before. And we're actually able to answer some of the questions we had about that deep history um, and particularly, you know, going back into prehistory, we're able to look at questions of, uh, of domestication and the spread of domestication, tracking that not only by looking at, for instance, the shape of bones, um, the shape of wild cereal grains, but also using ancient DNA to, to track the genetic basis of those domestication traits, um, as I mentioned earlier. So genetic research is, is also telling us about ourselves. So we're able to track um, the migration of ancient humans around the world um, and also look at the recent evolution of humans. So things like the spread of that LP gene um, through human populations. If we look at what genetic research is, is telling us about domestication and, and the spread of farming, it shows us how, how that idea spreads and how those species spread certainly. But what it's also showing us, and something that we really didn't know before, is just how much hybridization was happening. So the fact that after those, those crops are domesticated um, or start to become domesticated, it's a process rather than an event, um, and, and those livestock as well, they continue to exchange genetic material with wild species. And they do that all the way through um, to the present. It's not surprising, really, because they are very, very closely related. Um, still to those wild species. Um, but perhaps the level of hybridization is surprising. 
So for instance, if we look at apples, which I also write about in the book, it turns out that our modern eating apples are actually more um, wild apple that has been hybridized into those, those apples than they are the original apples, which by the way, come from Kazakhstan, another wonderful story, but I don't have time for that today. So I think these new scientific insights are, are crucial when we're looking back into the deep past. They're allowing us to explore that past in a way that we haven't been able to before. Um, but they're also important when we consider the challenges that face us today. And of course, where we are now is um, really the, the legacy of the Neolithic. I don't think those early farmers could ever have imagined how farming would burgeon and how the human population would boom uh, we estimate you know, up to 10 billion or so this century. There's a huge challenge facing us, of course. How can we support this still growing human population on the planet while preserving as much biodiversity as possible and mitigating the effects of climate change? Just last week in Birmingham, we held the in inaugural forum for global challenges, which was looking at both climate change and social inequality because it's clear that we can't tackle one problem without tackling the other. However we tackle climate change and biodiversity, we must make sure that no one is left behind. If we look at agriculture then and where we are with our, our food production, we already press 40% of the Earth's land surface into our service. So 40% of, uh, uh, of, of terrestrial land is um, is under agriculture, is under the plough. And then debate goes on about whether we should be pushing that land to be maximally productive, um, and that means excluding other species from it, um, or whether we should be going for a land sharing solution where wild species are allowed onto our farmland. It's a tricky debate because if we, if we reduce the number of wild species on our farmland, and really just went for the production of our domesticates, then perhaps we could preserve more actual wilderness um, and not, not encroach more on the wilderness. Um, but I suspect that we won't be able to, um, to, to progress in that way because we'd end up with lots of fragmented patches of wilderness. I do think it's gonna have to be a lot more joined up, but there won't be a one size fits all solution. That's the other interesting thing is that it would be very different in different localities around the world. Can we really afford to have livestock at all is another question, of course. Um, can we afford to feed animals and then eat them, losing that energy in the process? And it's absolutely certain that the rate at which we consume animals in uh, richer countries would be completely unsustainable if that was happening all around the globe today. So the onus is on the richer countries, I think, to start reining in their meat consumption. Should we look again at GM? Is it a version of what we've always been doing? Um, in terms of farming, in terms of artificial selection, or as I said, human mediated natural selection, or is it something quite different? Could we use genetic modification to reduce the amount of synthetic chemicals we're spraying onto crops, for instance, or the amount of fertilizer that we need on land? Perhaps surprisingly, some very influential green campaigners think so, and people are even starting to talk about GM organic, um, two phrases which I didn't think I'd ever see together in the same, in the same sentence. So all big questions to think about. From our expanding knowledge of genetics, I think one thing is very clear. We need to protect wild species, not just for their sake, but for ours as well. They represent a wellspring of diversity that has been bred out of many of our domestic allies. And of course they do other things for us as well. We depend on many other wild species in all sorts of way. Um, this plaque seen in a park in Bristol uh, which says you need us more than we need you, sums it up. But I would argue that there's a deeper moral imperative here to try to reduce our impact on all other species, not just those that we find useful. The thing about humans is that we are conscious and we are conscious of our impact on other species. And that consciousness brings with it, I think, responsibility. Um, as a species, we have... We have wrapped around the globe. We are absolutely everywhere. This goes right back to the Paleolithic, way before farming was even thought of. Um, and our, when farming happens, our, our population booms and our domesticated species, again, have traveled all over the world to become global species and species that started off in the old world, in, in Africa, Europe and Asia, have traveled over to the Americas and, and vice versa. 
It's obvious that the evolutionary success of our domesticates, things like wheat and cattle, depends a great deal on us. But the success of other species which have not been domesticated, which have not been sown, grafted, bred and bridled by us, also depends on their ability to survive in a world profoundly influenced by our existence and the existence of all of our domesticated allies. At this point in time, then, we don't just need to tend the species that we've teamed up with. We need to nurture the untamed wildness now more than ever. We cannot plough on with the idea that we can separate ourselves from the rest of nature. We need to learn how to live with it. It feels like the challenge of this century is learning how to accept those interrelationships, not to fight the wildness, but to thrive with it. Thank you.